Let me introduce all of the rest of our participants, um, and I'll do it in the order that we'll be speaking today. So following me will be a, um, a young uh, church planting pastor in North Carolina, Zach Barnes. Um, Zach is a recent graduate of Duke Divinity School, and I think you will find that Duke is the thread that holds all of the participants together. Um, so ja uh, Zach is over in Greensboro planting a church. He'll be followed by Adam Perez, um, who's currently a fifth year doctoral student at Duke, uh, working on a dissertation on an important um, setting for the initial setting for the training of worship leaders in the 1980s. Um, Adam will be followed by Jonathan Ottaway, who is originally from the UK, uh, from the London area, and is a third year doctoral student. And he's, um, he's working on a fascinating dissertation about 24-7 worship and prayer movements and the theology that motivates them. Um, Jonathan will be followed by uh, Glenn Stahlsmith, another third year doctoral student who's working on a dissertation about extemporaneous praying in churches. Glenn will be followed by Drew Eastus, um, who is a, was until recently a roving um, preacher, um, also a doctoral student at Duke, and is currently on staff at a church in Tennessee. Um, Drew will be followed by Debbie Wong, who is a native Singaporean um, and has introduced me some, to some excellent food in Singapore, as well as being a delightful student also here at Duke. So those are all of our participants. Um, I've highlighted their kind of educational background, but I, if I tried to go into all of their church accomplishments, um, that would occupy the entire time. Just trust it. Uh, trust me to say that all of them are experienced um, worship leaders, either as musicians or pastors or even missionaries. Um, so anyway, uh, let's, get, let's get straight to work here. And we're hoping that um, the basic premise of what we do is um, kind of unsettling in a way. Most of the time you don't put the words ancient and contemporary together. And so I and this working group, and sometimes we call ourselves the flow working group for the love of worship, um, we've been trying to find out ways to meld the ancient Christian world uh, with contemporary ways of doing worship. And so the, if I can kind of cover this real quick, the first step is to less undercut false presumptions, and unhelpful labels. So let me let just, I mean, I won't ask for you to actually speak, but if I was to ask you, is this a picture of contemporary worship or traditional? I'm guessing most of the folks would say contemporary. Um, or this, is this contemporary or traditional? Most folks would say that's contemporary. Uh, if I showed that picture, most folks would say, well, that's probably traditional. Okay, well, that's pretty easy. If we look at the kind of the outward stylistic aspects of it, it's easy to differentiate between contemporary and traditional. But let me try to complicate the matter just a little bit more. So here we have, here are the two pictures. We'll label them contemporary. One of them is, um, one of them is the Hillsong Congregation in Hong Kong, and the other one's actual Hillsong Congregation in um, Australia. But if I was to show this, and ask you, is this contemporary or traditional? I think most people would say this is traditional. And it's because of the way the order of worship is laid out, and there are kind of four folds to it. But what we want to do is be provocative this morning and suggest that all of these can be pictures of contemporary worship. And we're going to try to unpack this for you in terms of how do you take this order of worship, which is classic and traditional, um, and I mean that not in a stylistic sense, but traditional in terms of going back to the earliest centuries of the church, how do you do that in a contemporary way? And that will be what we'll be talking about this morning. Okay? So our goal is to try to make this order of worship 
which we presume needs to be done in a way shown in this picture, we want to undercut that presumption that this style of worship is the only way to do this order of worship. We want to talk about ways to do this order of worship that looks and feels very much more like this picture. And to that end, I and the rest in this working group um, have written this book, um, which our webinar today has derived its title from, figuring out how to do this order of worship in a way that looks and feels like um, good, authentic, contemporary worship is the goal of the book and our webinar, okay? Step number two. Uh, let's take a new look at the ancient roots of all Christian worship. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that order of worship that I used to have on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, this is a standard order of worship in many denominational resources. Um, some folks call it the fourfold order of worship, and that's because it's kind of got four large sections to it, gathering, uh, time spent, with the word of God, um, sharing and receiving, especially focused on communion, and then the sending of God's people. Um, many denominations have been pushing this order of worship over the last 30 to 40 years based on a variety of ancient sources, but in particular, this one text that you will see on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, this is the earliest kind of description of an order of worship that we have in the history of the church. This is from um, a fellow, Justin, who was martyred in the mid-2nd century, and this is his description of what Christian worship was like as he knew it in the 2nd century. And you can see the basic kind of folds there. Um, uh, there's an assembling, and so that's kind of the first fold, and then there's an extensive reading of Scripture, and that's the second fold. Um, and then after the sermon, uh, they offer intercessory prayers, um, and then the bread and the wine for communion is brought, and the presider prays a substantial prayer of thanksgiving, that's the consecration, and then the communion is shared. Um, and then in his description, he makes sure um, his reader knows that the communion elements are actually distributed to those who were not able to be present. And then he doesn't talk about a dismissal, but surely they had to leave in order to be able to assemble on the next Sunday. Um, this order of worship from Justin Martyr has been the main source behind all of the recent worship revisions, text-based revisions of Presbyterians and Methodists and Lutherans and Anglicans, um, everybody who's worked on the recent worship books know this passage. In fact, they know this passage by heart. What I wanna to suggest to you is that oftentimes they have overlooked critical elements in the passage. And uh, what the book Flow is based on is highlighting these overlooked aspects of the passage in Justin Martyr and noticing how much they correspond to standard marks of contemporary worship. So in other words, I want to suggest that the seed for doing ancient classic worship in a contemporary way is actually in the historic sources itself. We don't have to feel like we're violating um, the classic, ancient, uh, patristic way of worship by trying to do it in a contemporary way. Uh, take a look at this one mark, for instance. Justin says that when we start to read the scriptures, uh, we read uh, the prophets, and by that he means the entirety of the Old Testament, and the memoirs of the uh, apostles, that's a great way to reference the New Testament. These are the apostolic remembrances. We read both Old Testament and New Testament as long as time permits. I mean, that's really intriguing. So he's not talking about using a system of prescribed text. He's talking about once we get into the Bible, 
someone's having to use active discernment of when the reading ought to come to a close. They're trying to assess when it is that the Spirit is saying, it's time to wrap this up and move to the next thing. This open-ended time with the necessity of discernment um, is a classic mark of authentic contemporary worship. It's what worship leaders have to do all the time. Uh, Even in this highly technological uh, version of contemporary worship that we tend to do now, uh, worship leaders often have the ability to say, no, 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 let's look back, let's look back to that chorus one more time. Uh, let's back off on the singing and we'll interject some inter- extemporaneous prayer right now. So there's not a strict predetermined sequencing of elements. So open-ended time, that's the first mark of contemporary worship that we find in Justin Martyr. The second is this, extemporaneous praying. So there's no dependent upon written worship text or written prayer text in Justin Martyr. Uh, He even highlights that in the most important prayer um, in his service, which is the one that the presider prays at the communion table, that that um, most critical prayer is actually done extemporaneously also. Um, uh, The presider lifts up prayers and thanksgiving in a similar fashion to the best of his ability. Um, Indeed, I really think that the assessment of being able to pray the church's faith well in an extemporaneous fashion was part of the congregation's discernment of who it was that they wanted to ordain. Uh, uh, That the pastor's job was to be able to preach the faith in a way that got an amen at the end of the sermon and it was to pray the Christian faith in a way to get an amen at the end of the prayer. So if this most critical of prayers is extemporaneous, we can just presume, in fact, we know from the lack of documentation of written prayer text from the period, that all praying in Christian worship is extemporaneous. This corresponds with the typical standard practice of contemporary worship where the prayers arise from the heart. Um, Whoever's praying, whether it's the musician or the pastor, they dig deep into their hearts and find the words there uh, that need to be prayed to God and to have the congregation say amen to. So we have open-ended time. We have extemporaneous praying. The last mark of contemporary worship, classic, authentic contemporary worship that you can find in Justin Martyr, is a description of the order of worship as a flow of essential actions. Um, So you'll notice that uh, he doesn't have technical names for things, uh, except perhaps memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets. Um, But even there, you have a sense of kind of a verbal action there. These are the remembrances, the rememberings uh, of the apostles. But I've highlighted in red the essential actions that the service flows by. And what you get from reading his description is a sense of that, you know, once the service starts, it's not an idea of checking off the next item on there. It's an idea of flowing from one activity to the next, which is the classic way of thinking about contemporary worship as a flow of essential actions. So steps three, four, and five will be understanding the importance of flow, rethinking uh, what it means to plan with an order of worship, And then, fifthly, tending to the various aspects of getting to good flow today through an ancient order of worship. To tend to step number three, which is understanding the importance of the flow, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, um, Reverend Zach Barnes. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. And let me uh, begin by saying uh, thank you to everyone who is joining today. It is uh, a privilege uh, to be a part of this. this entire process actually 
and to get to learn with and from all of the contributors to this book. So today what I'm going to be doing for just a few moments is giving a historical timeline to what's going on in the modern uh, kind of movement of flowing in worship services, as well as just talking about the importance of it towards the end. To begin with, I, I think it's important to see that there is this what I would probably label as an organic stage that's where flow is really beginning to emerge. This idea of flowing within contemporary worship services are beginning to emerge. You see this in the 70s. I mean, as early as the mid 70s, there are notions of flow developing organically among churches. Uh, it's seen in some of the earliest vineyard fellowships. They are worshiping for extended periods of time, reflecting what Dr. Ruth was just talking about in Justin Martyr. They're praying for one another. Instrumentalists are shifting from one song to another during their worship time. I mean, you see this idea of flow happening. In some of the earliest uh, services at the Vineyard Cong uh, Sir, uh, Church there in Anaheim with John Wimber, uh, the worship team has no set list where they do this song for five and a half minutes, and then they go to this song uh, for six minutes, and then the last one for four and a half minutes. I mean, they they're going from one song to the next as they're being led by the Spirit. This organic stage, as these notions of flowing, are really starting to develop in concrete ways. One of the most important works to probably look at in the historical development of flow uh, is a work by David Blomgren called The Song of the Lord in 1978. That's when that was published. It's an instructional book for musicians, perhaps the first to actually be written to teach others how to achieve good flow in worship. He offers a few suggestions, such as the uh, grouping of courses based on the key in which they're written and the tempo. The, these are important categories to really consider because you don't want to go from fast to slow or from this key to that key back to another key um, because you're, you're wanting to build this sense of flow. This, you want to build up worship and to go from fast to slow or change keys too many times in ways that are not can be done in ways that are not conducive to uh, the buildup of flow. And all of these techniques that he uses, these ways of facilitating flow, serve a greater issue. And I think this is key that you find this throughout the literature and key to our discussions today. The, the issue is this, an awareness of God's presence in the midst of our congregation, being aware of what God is doing during our time of worship. It's not that flow brings God in, it's that flow makes us aware. Flowing in, in worship makes us aware of God's presence uh, among us. And just, just to say this, Blomgren's original ideas about creating flow in worship, these later become the standard, this becomes the standard language for contemporary worship. So this is this kind of organic stage that is happening. Um, but as this movement of practitioners of flow starts to develop, what I want to do for the, just the next few minutes is to highlight what I think are some important developments for us to understand uh, in the process um, uh, that came out of that organic stage. First, I think there is a development of technique and theological frameworks that are happening hand in hand. Uh, by the 1980s, there, there's coming this emphasis on various techniques and people are focusing more on that and the mechanics of flow within a service as well as the expansion of theological frameworks. Um, a key person uh, in this tradition is Bob Sorg, who in his um, Exploring Worship, a Practical Guide to Praise and Worship, he's encouraging worship leaders to, to work with musicians to ensure this kind of steady and consistent rhythm that ensures flow. I mean, what you will find throughout all of this is tempo is crucial. I mean, if, if, if you have the wrong tempo, it can be perceived by some as a spiritual heaviness. And so he's suggesting uh, that uh, you, you have a set list of songs prepared from the beginning and you, and you work with your musicians in such a way so that your tempo is on and everyone uh, knows how to flow from one song to the next. It, he says this in his particular work, that the list that you have of songs from the beginning that you want to sing, it is not sacred, nor is the order of songs engraved in heaven. If a different direction emerges, go with it. I mean, how many, you know, that, that's a question that's what, do we do that in our churches today? Um, now, of course, he's not saying just go with any, any, any song that you know. That He has a master list of songs uh, with two main categories, fast and slow, and then two subcategories, key and tempo, and you can kind of uh, 
pull from that as you're kind of navigating and flowing in worship. But what's so apparent in the 80s, by the 80s, is that you had this shift that's taking place. Um, the worship leader is an instrumentalist. Worship leading is no longer taking place at the, at the pulpit in many of these people's minds. It's, it's happening behind an instrument. And there's this shift that's, that's taking place. The, the second thing that I would highlight is I, I think there's an ecumenical development that's happening that wasn't necessarily taking place maybe in the organic stage, but uh, that is definitely happening by this time. I mean, by the 1990s, you've got literature on contemporary worship that is expanding and mainline congregations and even more traditional evangelical churches are implementing these, uh, we're in, uh, implementing these ideas. Uh, case in point, Don McMinn is, was the minister of praise and worship at a church in Dell City, Oklahoma. And he writes in 1992, the practice of praise and worship, a handbook on worship renewal. Now in this, he argues that worship uh, progresses in a way uh, from thanksgiving to praise to worship. What's interesting is charismatics have been teaching that for years at that, by that point. Uh, Tom Brooks published an article in 1986 arguing just for that, that we move from thanksgiving to praise to worship, this kind of flow of worship uh, that happens. I mean, men is arguing in services, he makes note in his book, that um, you know services that you should adjust in services as the Spirit leads you, something that uh, charismatic leadership, uh, charismatic worship leaders were already experiencing. Even evangelical megachurches pick up on this idea. And in 1999, Saddleback there in uh, California, well-known megachurch is offering music conferences where it's advocating for its uh, impact paradigm for worship. All, all of those letters, and you can see it in the chapter, all of those letters correspond to a particular song or movement in worship. And all of this is serving to guide one's affections into the presence of God. It's, it's a type of flow that is happening. The final thing I'd like just to highlight is we have, you've got that organic stage and then it develops is there really is, and I don't even know if this is the best word to describe, but there's an industry that really develops around flow. And what I mean by that is by, by the foul 2000s, you know, at this point, flowing in worship service, that language has been around for over 20 years. And you've got an abundance of literature being produced. You, you've got Darlene Sheck, who's writing extravagant worship in 2001. She was a worship leader at Hillsong Mega Church there in Sydney, Australia. Um, every, I can't think of uh, Darlene without thinking of Shout to the Lord. I right, made that popular. I mean, you've got her writing. You've got instructional vi videos that are appearing as technology has developed. Uh, I, I think this, I, I can't leave without um, referencing Paul Balash's uh, popular leading worship, creating flow instructional DVD, in which he's arguing for worship. Uh, the goal of worship is encountering the presence of God in a genuine way. And, and in this particular video, he's offering theological frameworks, practical tips, all of these things. He's doing everything from teaching head movements and uh, instrumental signals uh, to indicate transitions to the musicians so that flow can be developed. He covers the musical aspect, the vocal aspect, rhetorical aspects of worship. I mean, you just got this development. And so I think what ends up happening, and I think it's very telling, by 2013, Dan Wilt, uh, who was closely connected to the Vineyard Movement, released a book, How to Lead Worship Without um, Being a Rock Star. And I think what's so interesting about this text is, within the text, Wilt is presume, presuming basic principles of flow and transition, so much so that he doesn't even speak about tempo. And as if you remember just a few minutes ago, Tempo was very important to discussions of flow in the beginning. But I think by this point, certain notions of flow are in the liturgical water. It's part of the language. It's part of the framework. And so it shows that flow is definitely here to stay. So as just to give you that, br that brief kind of historical overview of what's kind of happening, I, I would just hit a few things about the importance of flow. I think first flow serves to draw us into the pre and make us aware of the presence of God. Uh, there's a word that you hear all the time, atmosphere, right? You want to create a, uh, an atmosphere, an environment that we are aware of the presence of God. Um, I, I think the best way to basic, uh, to compare this to is when you go into a beautiful church, when I would go into Duke Chapel and I'd see the beautiful stained glass windows and the tall ceilings. When I walked in, the atmosphere was such that it made me aware that God was there. 
And I think flowing in our worship services is probably, uh, it, it serves the same, uh, it serves the same purpose in contemporary worship services. Um, the, the importance of flow, especially to this particular tradition, is it, it's important because it's a biblical form of worship. They use the, the book of Psalms, and, and they saw there was this movement from thanksgiving to praise to worship, and, and they saw that as a biblical way of doing worship. I mean, let's look at the tabernacle. You move from the outer court to the inner court to the Holy of Holies. There's this progression, this, this flow to where we get to this point where we are in the presence uh, in this kind of um, uh, high moment of God's presence. And, and finally, I think since they would probably say since flow reflects biblical patterns, um, it directs the congregation and moves of worship that are holistic, that are thoughtful, and that are unified. And I think that's important because it, flow helps to people to navigate the liturgy, as well as it ensures that we're only meeting for a small time in comparison to the rest of our week. It ensures that our worship is directed and meaningful. And so th that's just a, a brief historical uh, overview and just some reasons why flow uh, can be important for us in our local congregations. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Thanks, Reverend Barnes. That's a, a great introduction and a great setup for um, what I want to share with you, which is um, building on these uh, historic principles and practical um, recent history as well, um, we move toward, toward thinking about what this means for our planning in worship. Now, you might have um, recognized so far that part of our goal is to help churches that are doing worship that follows an order of worship and a book of worship reimagine what it means to be uh, planning for something that feels authentically contemporary and uh, historically authentic. Um, and so we want to do that by, by shifting your thinking on what the order of worship is for, moving it from conceiving of it as a kind of business meeting agenda to uh, an action and event oriented communal encounter with God. And I think that begins by taking seriously that worship is something that isn't just read or spoken, but it's something that, it's, that is experienced. Worship that hopes to be contemporary has to take seriously the experience of the worshiper. And, and Zach just mentioned a lot of reasons why and where that, um, that commitment comes from. So it's not about uh, experience in general, which is, of course, um, important, but it's about experience in time. Flow is about how worship is experienced in time. So to say, achieving good flow is about honoring and stewarding our time in worship. So for, for my segment of this presentation, uh, I drew out five potential pitfalls uh, in achieving good flow from, from chapters two and three of the book, and there's a lot more there, but I want to focus on these five uh, potential pitfalls that can negatively impact our experience of time uh, in, in worship. Uh, and then following my, as I set this up, my, my colleagues will, will give you some great helpful strategies for um, thinking through how to how to deal with these uh, and avoid these potential pitfalls. Um, so let's attend to some of these uh, what we might call flow stoppers. First potential pitfall is dead time. Now I'm talking about accidental or incidental silence that leaves the congregation looking for who's supposed to be next. You've probably experienced that moment of uh, the music fades out, the organ stops playing, and, and nothing is happening. And, every, and you know, it's kind of a sideways glance of like, you know, who's rustling their papers, getting ready to go up, who doesn't realize that they're the person that's supposed to be next. These experiences distract us from an experience of the flow of time in worship. Or on the other hand, not incidental, um, uh, or not accidental uh, silence, but intentional silence. We think oh, I should really wait until the music is over until I go forward to speak. I don't want to interrupt the thing that came before me in the order of service. So, you know, I'll wait till the last words of the hymn are sung, stop, and then I'll make my journey from the third to last row all the way up to the front, clack, clack, click, clack, click, clack, uh, for, for, you know, uh, a long, what feels like a, an eternity for, the, for us in the pews um, until you get all the way to the front. So dead time um, is, a, is a hindrance to our experience of the flow of time. Um, and I want to note that I'm not talking about silence in general. 
we want to make space for intentional times of silence and intentional times of listening. But note that those kinds of times are prepared, they're set up, they're situated. They're not incidental or accidental, they're planned for. So uh, in our paradigm shift here, we want to move from meaningless gaps to seamless interconnection. From meaningless gaps to seamless interconnection. Our second Pit, potential pitfall is the redundancy pitfall. Think about the opening of worship, where often we've got eight different elements going on. We've got a prelude, then an introit, then a choral introit, then a scripture sentence, then the processional hymn, then the opening prayer, then the opening hymn of praise, the greeting, and the passing of the peace. Every single one of those items is trying to accomplish the same thing, establishing a sense of the church transitioning, as my pastor likes to say, transitioning from arriving here to being here. And this kind of redundancy happens at other points too. Think about confessional prayers. Um, the opening prayer, the prayers of the people, the communion prayer, pr prayer, these are all places where we like to sneak in a, a confessional prayer. And I mean, I'll admit, I've, I've got a lot to confess, but I have to ask, was it, was it not effective the first time when we confessed? Or are we asking for forgiveness for different sins at different times or sins maybe we've committed since the last time we confessed a few minutes prior? Um, these kinds of repetitions aren't necessarily helpful. Now there is space for meaningful repetition that again helps us to build a sense of what's going on, what's happening in worship. Um, but multiple events of the same thing, of the same event, when we're thinking about its logic or the goal of that part of the order of service can feel redundant to worshipers. It doesn't honor the progression of the event that we were talking about, that uh, Zach was talking about in flow from the beginning of the service to the end. I call it uh, spinning your wheels. You're just, you're, you're, you're revving the engine, but you're not actually going anywhere yet. So we wanna move from spinning our wheels to building momentum. We want to build momentum. And, and you can do this with uh, repetition, but not with meaningless redundance. A third potential pitfall, something that uh, I like to call thematic tetherball. Now, maybe you don't remember the uh, or never experienced the old schoolyard game. Uh, we, we could equally call it thematic tennis, maybe, where one theme gets bounced back and forth throughout the service and it never develops. Uh, for example, all the songs in a service are picked because they relate to the theme of grace or the Great Commission, regardless of where in the narrative of a worship service in that fourfold order in the flow from beginning to end, regardless of where they're placed in that flow. I was at a service last year where the opening hymn was Forth in Thy Name, O Lord, which is a hymn that is just one of the best sending hymns. It has just such strong language of being sent out into the world. And uh, it's a great hymn, but uh, not during the gathering necessarily, because it does the text and the sense of the, of the song propel us outward. Um, I mean, I think it probably came about because of this kind of thematic tetherball planning, where we just find songs that deal with our theme and we just plunk them in wherever there's open spots to fill songs. This can happen too when we have song sets. We pick, say, th two or three songs. We search the database for grace. And so we, we pull up two or three songs that relate to grace. And we just kind of put them in, in the order that maybe even from fast to slow or seems to have some direction. But it ends up just being kind of a grace-filled word salad. Um, it doesn't, in a word, flow. It doesn't go anywhere. So we want to move again, and similarly to the last one, from directionless to development. We want to move a theme or move our worship along that structure of the order of worship from beginning to end. Our fourth pitfall is one that I call, and now for something, completely different. It really comes from elements that are, uh, that are placed next to each other in a worship service that are unrelated. And I don't mean just unrelated liturgically, I also mean emotionally, logically, and in worship. So for example, the somber offertory organ selection, which uh, gives a sense of what an offering should be uh, in its own way, because they're happening at the same time. But the somber offertory organ piece selection 
It ends, and then the punchy youth pastor hops up on stage to tell us how amazing and exciting the events going on this week are at our church. It's emotional, and it's experiential whiplash. These elements are not connected. They don't flow from one to the next. They're disconnected. And we want to move from being disconnected to being interdependent. They come, our worship service and in the sort of small rhythms come as interdependent, connected, in dialogue with one another, emotionally, logically, and liturgically. And now pitfall number five, our last one, something I call cognitive dissonance. This happens when something, when what's said and what's done don't seem to link up. For example, the deadpan recitation of a communion prayer. It is a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Do we not recognize the language that we're using to, to pray this incredible historic prayer that says it's always a good and joyful thing to give thanks to God? Or maybe we don't believe it. Maybe that's not actually how we feel about giving thanks and praise. This What we say and what we do don't go together. Or here's another example, a, congr a congregational hymn processing to the front to receive communion, where maybe you receive by intinction, you take the, the bread and dip it in the cup and you walk back and return to your seat. And the song that's been chosen for this moment is, let us break bread together on our knees. Um, Last I checked, nobody was actually kneeling to receive communion, much less facing east, which is another important element of that, uh, of that song. And I, I do this, uh, I mean, this happens um, in other ways too. A, a worship leader, for example, who says everything through the same toothy smile. And for the record, it, it can be a very genuine smile. Uh, you can be a really happy person. That's great. But not every liturgical moment evokes that same emotional tenor, that same feeling. So what I want us to do is move from emotionally oblivious participation to affect conscious leadership so that what we say and what we do go together. And there isn't that sense of potential pitfall of cognitive dissonance. I think avoiding these pitfalls really helps us steward well the sense of time that the worship event creates. So uh, in conclusion here, we want to move, our, uh, move the needle on our planning and worship design and leadership from thinking about a business agenda to thinking about a, an adaptive experience. What I've talked about so far deals mostly in the planning, partially in the leadership too in the moment, but mostly in the planning. Um, and as we prepare for services of worship that flow well, what we can do is really set ourselves up well for thinking about how the actual event will be celebrated in time, in real time, with uh, what Zach described as that discernment of the spirit and what Justin talks about as being aware of the sense of how time, what time allows for. So for flow, we can't think of individual items in order of worship on their own, but part of this narrative arc that leads from the first moments of coming in the door to the final moments of being sent out. And I think when we do that, we're able to reimagine a, an order of worship that's, that's deeper, more faithful, more multi-sensory, more human, and really a deeper, commun a deeper communal encounter with God that feels authentically contemporary. So now that I've named and identified some of the places we don't want to go, some things we don't want to do, I want to pass it over to Glenn Stallsmith, who will get us started on some of the things we do want to do, some concrete strategies for achieving flow in worship. And I'll find my screen share here. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. I think you're handing the video over to me. Uh, I apologize. And I hand it over <laughs> to Jonathan. <laughs> well, thank you for the time to, to share with you all today. Um, I, I was thinking as, we, um, as Adam was going through, the, what we've seen so far is the kind of the big picture of moving towards flow. The kind of Dr. Ruth has given us the... Um, the scope of kind of what contemporary worship could be in this ancient contemporary model. Um, Reverend Zachary has given us some of the kind of historical overview. Adam's given us some of the really big picture things that we want to uh, avoid and aim for as we move towards contemporary worship. Uh, I'm one of the little picture people. 
so I'm going to talk today. Let me. Um, I'm just going to get my screen share going. So I'm talking today about musical flow. Um, and what I wanted to do was, uh, at the back of the book, we laid out some of the, the kind of, we called them beatitudes uh, for achieving flow. These are some of the, the big picture ideas that we want to, um, that we want to share. And I'm just going to take a few moments to uh, walk through a few of these with you, specifically about congregational music. And I'm going to uh, show them to you, and I'll take a few minutes to uh, exposit each one. Blessed and wise is the church whose music serves to engage worshippers in the fourfold structure of worship. So this beatitude reinforces something that the, the book at large is trying to teach and something that we, we've already said this morning, but I think this bears repeating. Um, moving to the cont a contemporary style, moving towards this contemporary style does not mean that the ancient structure of Christian worship should get lost in the process. It's not one against the other. Instead, in this book, we're striving for both. We want to encourage you as worship leaders and as pastors to underpin your church's gathering with a robust uh, order of ancient structure of worship. But at the same time, we also want to encourage you to fully embrace a contemporary style as well, uh, if that's what your church is doing. It's not one against the other. I think this cuts against many churches' uh, experiences of doing contemporary worship. For many churches that do contemporary worship, uh, the music often becomes a key structural pillar within the worship by itself. Uh, we have a time of singing and we're going to have songs together. And then we'll have a time of preaching, uh, maybe a time of response at the end. Instead, what, what, what I would contend for is that the music is not the structure within itself but it serves the larger structure of the worship. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't have extended times of congregational song. Um, I actually think that you can put songs together in ways that fulfill many of the components of worship. You can sing your confession of sin. You can sing a creed. You can sing your prayers to God. These things can be done together. Uh, instead, what I want to encourage you is to take upon your take a, take a shift in in how you think about this, rather than thinking we have contemporary worship, therefore we have a time of song followed by a time of preaching. Instead, we need to think about what does this time of congregational song achieve? What is it doing in terms of the wider? structure of worship that we are leading the congregation through? What story are these songs together telling? What journey is it taking the congregation on? Is it helping the congregation to assemble as God's redeemed people from going somewhere to being somewhere? Is, it, is the music preparing us to hear God's word? Is it helping us respond? Is it sending us out into the world? The music serves the underlying structure of worship, but the music is not the structure within itself. So, blessed and wise is the church whose music serves to engage worshippers in the fourfold structure of worship. Blessed and wise is the church whose music leader sees contemporary worship as offering opportunities to creatively invite the congregation into deeper participation. Now that I've kind of, I've laid out the, the almost the, the, the ground rules, the music needs to serve the worship, uh, I almost want to offer up the other side of the coin. In doing contemporary worship, you have a great amount of freedom to shape the service, to shape the structure of worship within that fourfold order, um, and even to shape the music, to bring in different musical styles. Uh, you are very free with how you do the worship in order 
to help your congregation participate in what is taking place. Traditional worship services often tend to carry with them uh, stricter ideas about the way in which worship should be done. And this is particularly true when we talk about the music. Um, for instance, in traditional services, there is a preference uh, for singing through songs and hymns in the strict logical order in which the song was written. Uh, there is also normally a desire to sing the song or hymn in its entirety. And there is definitely a suspicion about repetition. Uh, let's sing that chorus again. Let's sing that final line uh, in a traditional setting that can often be met with the response of, why? We've already sung it. Um, I actually have, I have one person in, in the church where, where I serve as the music minister uh, who believes that you, can re you should only repeat uh, a refrain or a line from a song if it's a complete sentence. Um, it needs to be, have a kind of a grammatical, logical wholeness in order to be a, a kind of a, a proper repetition. When you come to contemporary congregational music, many of these sensibilities that I've just described, they simply don't exist or they don't exist to the same degree. And this offers you great opportunity to be creative uh, in order to invite your congregation to participate in worship to a deeper in a deeper way um, let me give you an example you might have just sung a a song of confession that acknowledges our sinfulness before god uh, that asks for god's healing asks for god's um, forgiveness now you might think you might know a, a bridge or a chorus of another song that works really well to provide that kind of assurance of pardon that is right to follow a confession of sin. Uh, maybe something like, my chains are gone, I've been set free. Now, rather than needing to, rather than feeling the need to go right to the very beginning of the song and we're gonna sing the first verse, we're gonna sing the second verse, and now we can sing that great assurance of pardon. You can actually just go straight into the bridge. You can go straight into that chorus and no one will think anything of it. Uh, if you are so inclined, you can even improvise something. You can uh, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Those kind of rules that govern other uh, congregational settings are not applying here. So you have creativity, you have opportunity, that you have flexibility, you have, you have freedom to do creative things in order to help invite your congregation to see uh, the fullness of what is taking place in worship. Um, and in fact, you can be even more creative uh, than just reordering a song or just singing the chorus of a song. But I mention this as uh, some low hanging fruit uh, as an example. Finally, Blessed and Wise is the music leader who recognizes the church, uh, I'm gonna put in parentheses here, in contemporary worship, is led in congregational singing more by its ears than by its eyes. One of the things I talk about in my chapter is that the movement towards contemporary worship, I think we saw this in, in the pictures that Dr. Ruth put up at the beginning. Um, there's, a, there's a great difference in the layout, the look of a room of a church that's doing more traditional worship and, and the room that's doing more contemporary worship. And that comes down to the, the technologies that people use in order to lead the worship. Um, instead of using hymnals and orders of worship or prayer books in order to give the congregation a, a script of what is happening, you're more likely to have words on a screen or um, and this changes the way in which you as a congregational leader, as a music leader, as a pastoral leader, need to lead the congregation. Your congregation are not reading the script alongside you. They don't have the musical text which they are reading. And this puts more of an emphasis upon leading through the ears than through the eyes. 
Uh, this is particularly key for when we're talking about music. Congregations are not following along with a musical text in the hymnal anymore. Instead, they're listening to you as a worship leader, as you sing. They're learning how to sing songs by listening to you. Uh, and this has lots of implications, which, of which I can't uh, unpack at the moment, but let me just mention these briefly. It, it means that you need to think about the ways in which you are singing so that your congregation can follow you well. Uh, you need to consider how you yourself as a worship leader are worshiping so that the congregation are also encouraged uh, to engage in the worship. Uh, you need to consider how you're giving verbal cues uh, that lead the congregation. And in fact, this is a, kind of, this is a good moment of transition to passing over to Glenn, um, who's going to be talking more about the, kind of, the verbal nature of leading contemporary worship well. So over to you, Glenn. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, that's a, that last um, beatitude sets up very well uh, what I wanted to talk about in terms of spoken flow. So I just want to spend a few minutes um, thinking about what gets said in a service, and particularly how we can use our words uh, to help a service flow. So as Jonathan was saying, uh, much of contemporary services of a contemporary service is set up for the uh, for the ears rather than the eye. And as Dr. Ruth said in his introduction, there are um, there are lots of things that just by walking into a space and looking at a service that you can tell is more contemporary than traditional or vice versa. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, there was this phenomenon that kind of took over most Christian worship services, at least in many parts of the world, and that was called the Church Bulletin. Uh, and, and I grew up during that phenomenon, and I would walk into church every Sunday, and I would get handed a bulletin, and it would have the order of service in it, and I would follow that. It would be like a roadmap that would tell me where we were starting and where we were ending and where we would go in the middle. Now, since then, the bulletin has kind of become passe and has drifted off, and there's lots of reasons for that, uh, but not the least of which is because uh, there's a much uh, uh, there's a bodily expression now that has accompanied the rise of contemporary worship. So that, um, as you see that picture to the left of the screen, um, it's expected that uh, worshipers can participate with a full range of motion, and they don't really want to have things uh, in their hand that they have to hold in front of them to see. Um, so the church bulletin had a had a good run for a while. It was. Uh, it was the way that, that worshipers followed along and could tell what was happening, um, but, it, but it was a short run when you consider the, the long span of, of Christian worship. It certainly wasn't around when Justin Martyr uh, was guiding his, uh, his worshipers, and uh, it's kind of on the way out today. And, and when I was looking to set up this slide um, and working with Google Images, I could hardly find an image that had worshipers holding a bulletin. Um, but there are thousands and thousands of, of ones with worshipers' hands to the sky, um, praising God in what we would call a more contemporary fashion. Uh, but what that means is that we need in a more contemporary service, even one that's formed around the fourfold order, we need to create signposts. Worshipers need to have a sense of where they are and where they are going. So. Uh, in the chapter that I've contributed to the book, um, I, I talk extensively about signposting as a way for us to use our spoken words to help create a sense of flow. And essentially, a signpost has a signpost, uh, a spoken signpost or a verbal signpost says first where we've been, it mentions where we are now, and then it hints to where we're going. So let me give some examples in, in terms of spoken words that happen in a worship service. I'm going to first talk about spoken transitions. Then I'm going to talk about prayer. And then finally, I'm going to mention preaching. So 
a spoken transition, especially without a bulletin, helps guide the worshiper from one point to the next and helps create this seamless sense that we're in God's presence. And so I have just uh, one brief example here. It's taken from the chapter in the book. Uh, I would like for you to imagine that in a worship service, there is, for example, a reading from Luke chapter 11, the well-known parable of the prodigal son. And then after that reading, there is going to be the singing of a song, uh, You Are My Hiding Place. What would be an appropriate thing to say in between those two events? Now, if this was a traditional service and there was a bulletin and everyone could see that first there's a reading and then there's a song, you may not need a transition. But in a more oral format, when there's not a written guide, it's almost imperative that there be some kind of transition. And even if there is a bulletin, a good transition can still create a sense of flow. So here's an example of one that I uh, just drafted out, a transition that might work in that instance between a reading of Luke 15 and the singing of You Are My Hiding Place. You could say something like, the same God whose grace relentlessly pursues us also provides a home for our return. Stand and sing the song of praise to the one who is our hiding place. That transition does three things. It says where we've been. In other words, it references the Luke 15 reading that has just come before by naming some aspect of God, the God who relentlessly pursues. It also states where we are now. In fact, it gives clear instructions for what people are supposed to do. Stand and sing. Good transition tells people what they should do and what is expected of them. And finally, it says where we are going. So what comes next? Standing and singing, of course, is part of that, but there's a reference and a hint to the hiding place, which is the theme in the song that comes up. So just there in two sentences is a signpost. Where we've been, what's expected of us now, and where we're going. And we can also do that when we pray. Now, we do it over a larger scope, in our prayers. In other words, when we speak a spoken transition, we're only talking about what's happening in the joints of a service. What just happened? What's happening now? What's going to happen? A prayer takes into the broader scope of God's salvation history. And I like to borrow from the collect form. And even even though I don't pray in collect form necessarily, I let the the parts of it inform my thinking. if you're not familiar with the collect form, it's very easy to find it online. There's a, it's outlined in the chapter of the book um, on the five parts. Um, but the three middle parts of the collect form are basically a signpost. They say where we've been. In other words, it's a remembering of who God is, how God has been revealed in Scripture, how God's salvation history has unfolded, and we name that. Some people call that the God who part of a prayer. A college form also says where we are now. It names present-day petitions and intercessions. It's, it asks God for intervention in our lives, where we're standing, where we're living in this context. College form also points to where we're going. It names a purpose and a hoped-for outcome. Now, if you're not from a transition that thinks about colics, um, you may still, however, be familiar with the collect for purity. Um, many of you might have this memorized. I don't have this on the screen, uh, but many of you know it. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. That collect does those three things. It names who God is, to whom all hearts are open, all desires know, no secrets are hid. It lifts up present day petitions, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, and it names a hope for outcome, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your name. You don't have to pray in that form, but naming those things are good components of our prayers. Many of the Eucharistic prayers, like the United Methodist Great Thanksgiving, have those components in them of a remembering 
a naming of what's happening now, and a hope for eschatological future. Finally, we can create signposts in our pre. So a sermon can also have these three main moves, starting with where we've been. Well, with the sermon, where we've been is usually a scripture reading or a remembrance of how God has been revealed. So we're naming something that God has done in the past. That's where we've been. A good sermon also names where we are now. It gives a fitting word for the people. It doesn't just exegete scripture. It doesn't just give a context of things that have happened in the past. It also speaks a fitting word for God's people right now. And finally, a sermon names where we are going. It names a promised future in God. And there's three subcomponents there that I'll just mention as I close. A sermon speaks to where we're going in three senses. So what happens, for instance, after the sermon? Are we headed towards the communion table? It's good if the preacher can mention that, can incorporate what our communal response is. Are we going to sing a, a, another song or a, or a song set? If so, what, are we, what is our response meant to be communally during that? Lifting hands, going forward for prayer, being anointed with oil, coming forward for baptism? It's good if the preacher can name what the expected response is. There's also a sense of where we're going after the service. So what's the reality that awaits us outside? After the sending, what, after the, the benediction, we call it in some traditions, where are the Christians headed after this? What are the worshipers awaiting outside? The preacher needs to at least acknowledge that. We're not going to stay in church uh, until Jesus comes back. Finally, there's a hope for future component that talks about what happens after the resurrection. This is the good news of the gospel, that Christ has defeated death. Because of that, we can join in Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, those three layers don't necessarily come in that order in a sermon, but it's good if the preacher can mention that in those are three ways that we're looking forward. What happens next in the service, what happens after the service, and then what happens at Christ's return. I will now uh, turn things over uh, to my friend and colleague, Drew Estes. Hello. It is uh, so good to be with you all. And uh, thank you so much for letting us be here and join you today. I am going to talk about the visual elements of the service, particularly the electronic visual elements. Let me share this with you where you can see it as we go. Because not only are there spoken elements and musical elements, of course, in a contemporary service, there's generally visual elements, particularly with screens and projections. And so there are four Beatitudes I want to share with you, four kind of nuggets dug out of the chapter that I wrote. Uh, they can at least get us on the right track, kind of wet the whistle, if you will, of what is needed to make this work. The first one there we go. Blessed is the visual liturgist who only uses images and videos that develop the theme of the service. Now this is a huge one. That's why I put it first. You oftentimes see in services that people will throw in videos and they'll throw in images just because they happen to be attractive or they happen to be entertaining or they happen to be funny or what have you, but, but they don't do anything to move the purpose of the service along. They're distracting, in fact, if anything, and they don't serve a larger purpose. So, so for instance, if you were to have a sermon title slide, and I just used the title of the sermon I preached most recently, Singing in the Sorrow from Psalm 13, and you stick it on a lighthouse slide, but you don't intend to say anything about lighthouses. You just think it's a pretty background. Now, most people in the congregation are going to sit there the whole time trying to figure out what the lighthouse has to do with this thing. And just because it looks attractive is the only reason it's there. And it's actually distracting from the point. Uh, but conversely, if you had a sermon uh, entitled A Light in the Darkness, and you were going to talk about our witnesses, Christians, and lighthouse was going to be uh, an illustration you drew upon, now it serves a purpose. So 
same thing with the videos. You don't want something just to be able to say you had a video. Some churches, I know, feel that kind of pressure to have something. And I would say if it doesn't serve a greater purpose in telling God's story, just don't do it. It's actually more hurtful than anything. The second beatitude. Blessed is the visual liturgist who uses fonts and colors that are congruent with the emotional tones of liturgical actions. So fonts and color, which a lot of times I think we might not think about, actually do a lot more heavy lifting than we might generally think. Because fonts and colors both have associations in our minds. They make us feel certain things. They make us think certain things. So for instance, a script font, which would look like handwriting, it, it automatically has a personal feel. People start thinking about a letter their grandma wrote them or something like this. And so if, if you have a sermon, series say you're going to the pastoral epistles and, and so you do a sermon series uh, letters to a pastor you can see where the handwritten personal kind of font there is fitting for what you're trying to convey and communicate um, same instance with colors here some colors uh, have different feelings associated with them and all of that is culturally dependent it's not a one-size-fits-all thing but for instance here in America where I am, you, you, yellow colors, bright colors typically have a happy, more joyous feeling. Blue colors, a more somber feeling. And so you could imagine how that would affect the service. You, you don't want to associate a color that's happy with a liturgical action that's sad or vice versa. So, for instance, if you're wanting to do Psalm 13, singing in the sorrow, and you want to put that text on, you wouldn't want to put a yellow, happy background. That makes everyone feel warm and happy, but yet you're reading, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Not happy, not bright, but same verses. On a black background, it sets the mood and the tone, and it's not distracting because people feel the, the disjuncture whenever it doesn't line up. So you want colors and you want fonts that communicate the same tone that you're trying to communicate through the liturgical action, whatever that might happen to be. The third beatitude, blessed is the visual liturgist who smoothly transitions the slides at the optimal time. Now this is a big one, and we're seeing churches right now during all this, this pandemic really having to, to learn a lot in terms of uh, their technological standpoint. But this is one the church struggled with for a while, a number of ways. And there's some sort of basic things I want to break down here that might be helpful. It, it basically, being able to transition slides uh, comes down to technique and it comes down to timing, those two things. If you get those two things, you won't have a problem with it. In terms of technique, you don't want anything distracting. So flips, ripples, uh, that actually draws attention away from what's happening. So for instance, if you're See, at that point, you're paying more attention to the flipping screen than you are the words on the screen, which is precisely what you don't want uh, during a sermon. Uh, I saw that actually just happen a few Sundays ago that, that someone had this distracting thing in their sermon slides. And to be honest with you, I spent 30 seconds thinking about how cool that was and completely lost what he said. That, that's not what you, you, you want there. You also don't want anything overly abrupt. Uh, Sometimes if you have a, a direct cut where one thing disappears, another thing shows up, that can be jarring, particularly if, if the colors are drastically different. So if you go from yellow to black for some reason in the service and in an immediate cut, it, it's jarring. When you get large screen with a bunch of color, that's a whole lot of change very quickly. Uh, it's, it's better to go for something more subtle, dissolve a fade, and you can actually time these dissolves and fades to the pace of what's going on. You can do it like 0.3 seconds for slower stuff, 0.5 seconds for medium stuff, 0.7 to, to a second. For, you, know, you, you can essentially get your timing where the, the fade is in congruence with what's happening uh, timing-wise as well. And what you want, this is, this is the thing, the best transition is the one no one notices. That's one of the flips and the cuts, you notice it. But if you can get to dissolve and you time it right, people won't even think about the slightest changing of what's going in front of them. Um, now, you know, none of this, I want to be very clear, 
none of this is an exact science. It, it's an art. So I don't want you to agonize over, oh my goodness, is this 0.4 seconds or is this 0.5 seconds? When, when should I do? I don't, same thing with the color. Don't agonize over this shade of purple. Is it, you know, but just be in mind. I have it in mind and, and it'll save you a lot of trouble. The second half of that is the timing aspect. And that comes down to what you're wanting to do. So every part of the service will kind of have a different way that this works. So for instance, if you're wanting them to repeat text, so you're putting a song up there, you're putting a prayer up there, the next slide, you wanna to go to the next slide, whenever the congregation says, prays, sings, the final word on the slide that's up there. You, you don't want them to get to the end of the slide and then not know what they're gonna say next. As soon as they get to the last word, pop up the next one, that way they're ready to go along and it doesn't cause a gap. Otherwise, the first word of the next slide, they're not going to sing it because they won't see it in time. Breaks flow. The instrumental pieces or pauses, you want to put a blank slot up because otherwise people feel anxiety and they think they're supposed to be saying something when, when they're not necessarily. And so as soon as you get to the last word, if it's going to go to a pause or an instrumental, just go ahead and go to it. Then people know they're good. They're not supposed to be doing anything. And then the preaching slides, I'm big on this. I'm a homiletician by training. So uh, appear immediately after the speaker says the idea. You could pop something on the screen a second before you say it, and people will be so distracted reading it that they don't actually hear you anymore. It, it kind of upstages you, and you don't want that. And then also very important, you uh, want all the slides to transition without prompting. I actually just heard a friend preach the other day, and middle of his sermon, he had to stop and say, hey, hey, could we, could we go to the next slide? Yeah, yeah, the no, the next one. Yeah, there, there you go. Well, at that point, you've lost your congregation for about 30 seconds there because they're all turning around looking at the sound guys trying to see what's going on. So you want to just, these basic rules just kind of help uh, to guide the service. Last but not least, the fourth beatitude, blessed is the visual liturgist who remains stylistically consistent through the entire service. And you can kind of see that in what we did even here. Imagine if the first beatitude had a big green background and then the second beatitude had blue and the third beatitude had purple and it looked like they didn't even go together right you, you wouldn't do that and yet so oftentimes in church that's exactly what we'll, we'll do we just have different colors for everything and nothing goes together um i found a, a helpful thing from from lynn wilson he talks about standard designs design standards and every week sticking with the same font sticking with the same color scheme Basically, if a scripture shows up, let all the scripture slides be the same, unless you have an intentional reason for not, right? It's not, again, art, not science. But every time a song comes up, use the same background for that. Uh, you, you can vary it, right? The song slides and the scripture slides can, can be somewhat different, but you want them to look like they go together in, in some capacity. And that'll just help people be able to have a cohesive quality to the service and be able to just see how everything fits together. Uh, rather than being jarred by all the transitions. Anyways, I hope that was helpful. There's a lot more in the book than what I could cover, obviously, uh, but those four will, will get us started. And I will hand it off to my colleague. Thanks, Drew. Um, let me get my screen up. So we're coming to the end of the webinar. Uh, yay. <laughs> And that means that it's time for us now to try and put all of these principles into practice, right? All these things that my colleagues have been talking about. Um, how do we actually pull them together as we design and lead a service using these ideas? And that's the task that has fallen to me to try to accomplish in the next 10 minutes. Uh, if you are someone who plans worship, you know there's a lot that goes into it. And so I'm going to try to speed through it, but uh, just stick with me. So let's start by looking again at an ancient fourfold order. Uh, so this is taken from the United Methodist Hymnal. Uh, you know, it reflects those four sections that uh, we've referenced throughout this webinar. And as you can see, there are many, many items on this order of worship, right? Um, and so the thing to remember is that we are coming to this, to this exercise, if you will, with the assumption that there's some kind of wisdom in this fourfold order that we want to preserve in a more contemporary form, 
right? What, what we're not trying to say is that this specific ancient order is the best thing, uh, but rather that the items in here actually point us to something essential about what worship is and what worship involves. Um, in other words, what are we actually trying to do when we gather together in a worship service, right? What is the meaning of prayer uh, or of singing when we do these things in worship? And once we identify that deeper goal, uh, the essential actions, which is what we're calling it, uh, then, like Jonathan said, we're actually freed to more creatively use whatever tools we can think of to accomplish those goals, right? So, for example, if we are uh, trying to plan out a section in the service where we're going to confess our sins to God, well, there are different ways we could do that, right? We could sing a song. There are songs that uh, whose lyrics kind of express that confession. Uh, we could have someone lead a prayer. Um, we might have a time of silent prayer and sort of guide the congregation to to confess uh, in their own way, in their own time. You might even have an activity that involves people, let's say, writing down a confession on a piece of paper and bringing it to, to the front or to the foot of a cross or something like that, right? So the point is when our focus is on these, these goals and these deeper essences of worship, uh, we are free to creatively plan and design the activities that we will use to then accomplish those goals. So compare this order uh, of worship to this next one, um, which I think is a pretty typical contemporary order. Um, you know, like uh, Glenn was saying, we typically don't see this in printed form, but many churches nowadays that use uh, that do contemporary worship use things like uh, planning center and stuff like that, and they actually have to list it out in this way, right? And there are going to be slight variations from church to church, but you know this is a basic structure that that you see pretty often. And one thing you'll notice Im immediately is that you're not squinting to try and read what's on the screen anymore because there are far fewer things in this order than the previous order, right? Um, but even though there are fewer items, as it were, we actually can accomplish all the same goals as the, the ancient order of worship, right? Those goals aren't as obvious here. They're not as clearly stated or prescribed just from looking at this list, right? We don't see like song of confession or song of praise. We just see opening set, which we know means we're going to have like three or four songs. Um, but that's actually precisely what gives us that greater flexibility to determine how to accomplish the goals. Right, we're free to make the order work for us. And by for us, I mean, you know, for the purposes of accomplishing these essential goals in worship. Um, so the goals are the same. Uh, the ancient order can serve as our reference for that. Um, but then we get to decide how we want to achieve those goals or those essential actions. So two questions um, that I think are helpful as we try to plan worship to guide our planning um, is, like I said, number one, what are the goals of worship? Um, what is it that every worship service is trying to do specifically? And again, I don't mean, you know, we need to pray, we need to sing, but as we're doing those things, what are we actually trying to do? And um, the second question then is, what will we use to achieve those goals? And the second question, I should say, is, is more relevant when we have a completely clean slate to work with. Uh, remember, we're not trying to give you a template here uh, or a new and improved template. Uh, shopping list of objects for you to use, right? That's what we're discouraging, actually. Um, but, but we're trying to show you that this approach actually allows for creativity. Um, however, like I said, uh, in reality, many churches actually follow a pretty standard order from week to week. And many of us, I would guess, who are tuning into this are probably in situations where we don't actually have uh, the ability or the authority to make many changes to that order. So for the sake of our time together, we're just going to work within, um, you know, a basic order that I showed earlier that that kind of prescribes the tools that we're going to use, right? For example, like I said, you can expect probably that your service is going to start with a set of songs, you know, three or four songs back to back. Um, but even within those constraints, uh, I think we can still apply many of these principles to achieve um, greater flow uh, and to help our worship move along more swiftly. So two more principles that um, I think are useful as we dive into the details of the planning. Uh, firstly, that every part of the service should serve the whole. Um, so we keep the larger movements, those four movements in mind, right? From the gathering to the word, to the table or response, uh, to sending. And we need to always bear that in mind, whatever 
mini section we're working on, um, as well as keep the larger gospel narrative in mind, right? Our worship services are helping to tell that whole story over time. And the second principle, which others have touched on already is that in contemporary worship more than one thing can happen at the same time. So in traditional services, you know, usually each part of the service is pretty self-contained. You know, you sing the hymn, the organ stops, and then someone comes up, leads a prayer, and then that ends and someone else takes over. Um, in contemporary worship, there tends to be a lot more overlap, right? Um, like I said, for the sake of planning, we often have to put it in a sort of linear chronological order, but in practice, we often have multiple things happening at the same time. You have music that, that underlays a prayer or maybe even goes back and forth, um, scripture that can be read in the middle of a song, you know, things like that. And so we shouldn't be afraid to use those different tools and different activities in conjunction and to layer them and interweave them all in the service of um, the essential deeper goals of worship. So let's try and put this together in the context of a service. Um, in the book, we actually provide a full sample service that comes with commentary explaining the choices that are made, you know, how, how we see this all fitting together. We obviously ha don't have time to do that now, uh, but I'll just walk through a few portions of it um, to, to kind of give you an idea of the process and the questions that, uh, that I use, at least as I'm trying to plan worship. So I typically begin uh, by looking at the scripture reading and the sermon for the day, uh, not because that is the most important part of the service, uh, but just for the very practical reason that that is often the information and the only information that is fixed or that's given. So, you know, I would get the scripture, get a sermon title. If I'm lucky, there's a synopsis, right? Uh, take some time to meditate on the passage and, and figure out what themes are going on and, you know, ask God what it is that God wants to say to us this Sunday. And based on that, then you try to draw a narrative arc of the whole service, right? So remembering this is the second movement of word. Uh, before that, we have the gathering, then we have response, and then we have um, the sending. So think about that as the whole. Um, and you might want to think about, you know, what attributes of God do we want to focus on this week as we gather? Um, what is the promise and the challenge that this word is posing to us and how are we going to respond to that? Uh, what other parts of the story are missing that we need to, to bring out either in the songs or in the prayers or, you know, other parts of the service? And so in this case, uh, John 21, the passage is where, you know, Jesus is reinstating Peter, right? He asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Uh, and then tells him, feed my sheep, follow me. The sermon title is something about hope. That's all that we have to go on. Um, so, you know, maybe you spend some time with that and you think, hmm, what is the hope that's being offered? Uh, is it the hope that, you know, like Peter, we, we who have failed are still accepted, still welcomed and still um, pursued even uh, by Christ to be his disciples, to follow him? Uh, there's that sort of hope of redemption. Um, there are obviously many different directions that this could go. Uh, but let's say we decide we want to begin the service with praising God for the saving works that he has done, uh, which is always appropriate, I think, uh, to begin a service by remembering that, you know, we worship because of what God has done and not, it's not primarily something that we do for God. Um, and then as we progress through the service, maybe we want to lead people to acknowledge uh, our need for God, why the good news of hope that we're going to hear is in fact good news at all. Right. And at the same time, maybe we want to emphasize that um, that what that hope is. Right. Which might be expressed uh, in terms of God's faithfulness or God's steadfast love, even when we are unfaithful. So whatever narrative arc you come up with, that's going to guide your choice of songs and how you lay out the rest of the service. Remember, we're not trying to do thematic tether ball, as Adam said, right? And we don't want to just sing every single song that has the word hope in it. Um, so let's say we choose these three songs. Um, that reflect that sort of basic trajectory I outlined. Um, if we had time, we could go into more detail, but for now, you'll just have to trust me that they do. Um, and so apart from the thematic considerations, apart from thinking about, you know, what attributes of God do these songs present, we also want to be thinking again about those deeper uh, essential actions of worship, right? So maybe we look at this order as a whole and we realize, hmm, there's no designated time for a confession in this order of worship. 
And we think in the context of where we're going in the service, it actually might be appropriate for us to uh, to confess our need and our brokenness for God um, as we head towards the sermon, right? So in this case, the song Broken Vessels functions both as an act of praise for what God has done, right? It says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Um, but it also expresses um, kind of confession that we are broken vessels in need of God's healing and that God alone can make us whole. And so I'm not going to go much into the music and the spoken transitions because Glenn and Jonathan have already done that and there's a lot more great stuff in the book but just bear that in mind as well that as you plan the songs you also want to think about how you're going to transition between them uh, that's not to say you need to say something between every song and you probably shouldn't do that um, but oftentimes spoken transitions can actually really help to connect songs to one another to show um, to help lead the congregation to see that narrative arc that you know in your mind but that they you know they can't read your mind they don't necessarily know where you're going it helps to make that um, intelligible to them so oops sorry went backwards um, so I'll just highlight two more things. Um, firstly, in an order of worship like this, when, like I said, we're not working from a completely blank slate, uh, there are a few areas that I think typically afford us still a bit more flexibility. One of those is the prayer times. Um, you know, we ha there are many different kinds of prayer, right? Different things we could pray about. Um, and in this case, in the service, we might notice that there's no prayer outlined yet for um, illumination, right, before the scripture reading. So maybe we decide, okay, we want to use this time of prayer this week to uh, to say a prayer, to ask God to open his word to us that we might hear and understand. Now on a different week, it's possible that we would have a song like, let's say, Speak, O Lord, by the Gettys, which actually functions itself as a prayer of illumination. So in that case, after we sing the song, it's not necessary to again say, now let us pray for illumination because we've just done that, right? Like we're saying different, the same tool can actually be used to accomplish um, different actions and different essential actions can actually be accomplished by different tools, right? So that's the flexibility that we have to work with in contemporary worship. And then finally, um, we have the time of prayer following the sermon as well. Um, this is oftentimes used as a prayer for the people, as intercessory prayers, but it might also be used as a time for your congregants to respond more individually or personally to the sermon, right? So again, there are many options here. You could have someone lead it. You could um, offer a quiet time for people to sort of reflect on what they've heard. Um, you might have some sort of physical activity that you want them to engage in. And again, the, the idea that you can interweave different um, tools and different uh, activities here comes into play because it's very easy to put some music under the prayer or perhaps you have a prayer that's maybe even based off of different verses in a song or in a hymn and so you have you sing a verse someone leads a petition that's sort of based on the themes of that verse and then we sing the next verse and so on and so on um, there's a lot of flexibility within contemporary services and the thing that really guides us is not so much what does this list say I need to do next, but what are the essential things that we're trying to accomplish in worship? And that's what helps us uh, decide, you know, if something we want to do is appropriate or not. So that's all the time we have today for talking through the service. I hope it was somewhat helpful to see a kind of a, a worked example of how we might apply some of these principles to both the planning and the leading of a service. And if you're thinking that, you know, this approach we're talking about actually requires a lot more work, that we're making your lives more difficult, uh, it is kind of true, right? It does require a lot more thought and intentionality, uh, I, but I think it's a more holistic approach to planning and one that is, is worth the effort. Um, it's obviously done best when everyone who's involved in leading the different parts of the service is on board and on the same page, which is often not the case in many churches, but I think we can still do a lot um, to incorporate these principles and these approaches into the parts of worship that we are responsible for. And hopefully, you know, others will notice something different and soon they too will be caught up in the flow. So I'm going to hand this time back to Dr. Ruth, who will close us out. So thank you very much, Debbie, and everyone else who participated.
Um, let me just wrap up really quickly so we can have some time for questions and answers. <coughs> Excuse me there. Um, generally what you can tell is that what we're advocating involves both a change of perceptions and assumptions and also particular techniques in terms of planning and leading worship. Um, to come back to that main idea though of um, changing perceptions and assumptions, um, I would like to draw upon an analogy. Um, Let me get this up and running. Um, and I want to dissuade you of one sort of analogy, which is to view an order of worship like a meeting agenda or a shopping list of disconnected items. And on rare occasions, I've actually seen worshipers hold their bulletins. And as we've done something, they've checked it off. Um, I've seen it in business meetings, uh, I've seen it in grocery stores, and unfortunately I've seen that in worship services too. So we don't want you to see an order of worship as a, a set of discrete items. But I don't want you to see it either like a play-by-play -play documentation in sports. If you're a sports fan, you know what I'm talking about. You can read a summary. Um, of a sporting event, for instance, like here's an episode from the National Basketball Association from a year ago, the basketball playoffs, um, a particular moment um, when the player on the left was scoring, and this is how the... Only for the five way or the others? Can you... I'm sorry, what was that, Justin? I'll just keep going on. Here's what that looks like in terms of a play-by-play, -play. and you can see they're isolated items. Um, and unfortunately, many people treat an order of worship uh, like a play-by-play -play thing here. We do one thing, get it done, move to the next thing, get it done. But here's that same event, this event in a narrative form. Uh, Kyle Lowry stole the ball and pushed it ahead, then waited for Kawhi Leonard to arrive before feeding his all-star teammate for a thunderous one-handed slam. Uh, the building erupted after that dunk. Uh, you can just see, there's, this is the raw data, this is the drama. And that's the sense we want you to bring to an order of worship, even an ancient fourfold order of worship like this, that it is a dramatic encounter with God, with the living God. That's what this is actually about. Here, the entrance is the first of the four folds as a play-by-play -play list. And I'm taking this from the Methodist denominational resource. Here's the same information as a dramatic story. Gathered by the Spirit of God as the body of Christ, God re-energizes the church assembly as a graced fellowship enjoying the presence of the risen Christ. Staggered by how quickly grace is offered and the wonder of Christ ongoing presence, God's people respond time and again in praise and adoration of God, opening their hearts in all honesty so that this day's encounter with God may bear all possible fruit. That is this information in a narrative form. It is difficult to look at this list and envision how to do it in a contemporary way, the style of a contemporary service. But this, however, I think lends itself to thinking through, if this is what we need to do in an extended worship set, for instance, what are the songs and the spoken elements and the visual elements that will help us achieve that? So let us rethink all our orders of worship as a story of dramatic encounter with a living God. So that was my brief wrap up. And um, I think we have some time for questions and for answers.
Judith, would you like to yes. step back in, help moderate this, please? Okay, yes. Thank you very much, uh, the team, for, for uh, leading us into a very, very insightful rethinking of how we order our uh, orders of worship. This is the time for question and answer. Now, we have sent Dr. Ruth a list of questions that were already asked in your registration form. So let's ask, uh, let's let Dr. Ruth uh, address those questions now. Dr. Ruth? Okay. And I'm going to invite the other panelists uh, to answer too. The first one um, is this one. How can we decouple words like contemporary and traditional from the cultural baggage they have accumulated and reclaim them for use in framing our worship practices going forward. Um, I think we decouple them slowly because the baggage accumulated slowly and will be decoupled slowly. But I want to suggest that every service needs to be both contemporary and traditional in these senses. Every order, uh, every service of Christian worship needs to be contemporary in that it is fitting for that particular group of people. It is done in a way that enables their maximum participation and uh, triggers their maximum investment in it, um, that it taps especially into their piety and their spirituality, what it is that they love about God. So every Christian worship service ought to be contemporary in that way. Similarly, every Christian worship service, even the contemporary ones, need to be traditional in achieving some of these classic actions of worship. That is a full range of prayer, a full story of what God is doing, um, and uh, kind of like a full range of attitudes and orientations. Uh, postures of the soul. Um, so I think that's how I would go about trying to decouple the terms traditional and contemporary. I want to um, add their, one, ele one element yes, to please. that from uh, conversations uh, Glenn and I have had that um, I think even the language of differentiating between contemporary and traditional uh, for many of the youth in our contexts uh, is falling away in that increasingly it's just the language of worship worship is becoming the overarching term so uh, i wonder if this uh in part th these this language this differentiation is slowly fading slowly fading on its own um yeah and i think that's due to the overwhelming um growth of what we would call contemporary worship but the rest of the world just calls worship um, which is a charismatic kind of pente charismatic pentecostal expression yeah. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Let's move to the second question. Why do you feel the prescribed worship orders are important? Um, the reason I think they're important is because every Christian community is going to fall into some sort of pattern or order of worship. It's just inevitable. So let's look to the ancient ones because there's some wisdom there and things I've already mentioned, like there's a full diet of prayer. Um, there's a full diet of scriptural remembrance in terms of a wholeness of telling the story of God. And there's a fullness in terms of uh, the way they stretch our souls or our spirits in terms of the way they posture towards God and orient towards God. So if every community is going to fall into a pattern of worship, let's just pull from the wisdom of the ancient ones, even though we're not slavishly attached to them. Any other comments from the panelists on that? I think it ties to a later question that someone else asked um, about how are the prescribed orders of worship relevant to churches of a Pentecostal background? Um, and the way that I understand it, like Dr. Ruth was just saying, is that it's not that we're trying to follow these orders, you know, step by step or because, you know, this is the best way to do it. But that's sort of a useful reference point for us to think about what worship really is. So I think, you know, 
it's, it's sort of a stand-in that guides us to, to answer that question of what should we be doing in worship, but it doesn't necessarily have to come from there, right? You, you're informed by scripture and other theology as well, but it's just a convenient way um, that is used in many traditions that, that gives us that sort of answer. Thank you very much, Debbie. I mean, if you take a look at all of the classic ancient orders of worship, there's just there's a fairly kind of limited range of actions that you see in there. Uh, God's people praise God, they thank God, they adore God, um, they confess sin, um, they petition for themselves, ask God for things for themselves, they intercede for others, they offer themselves. Um, they unify themselves, um, and occasionally there are moments of lament. Um, you know, if you think about that, those are many of the same actions that you find in the Lord's Prayer. Um, that The one prayer that the Lord taught us has many of those same sort of actions. Um, you know, specifically, I'm struck by how few how many congregations have omitted um, intercessory prayers for others as part of their communal setting. And I think that's a particular point where ancient orders of worship can kind of remind us of something that's easy to lose and can help us find ways to recover it. So. Um, next question, to what extent um, should our liturgies respond and adapt to the situations, current events, and cultural context around us? Um, gosh, I'll ask really good questions. Um, fully and paradoxically, not at all. Um, this is one of the hardest things, I think, for an individual congregation to remember that their worship service is their worship service. And so it needs to be attentive to what they're struggling with, what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, um, what their felt needs are, um, uh, the way they love and view God. But any congregation's worship service is also the worship of the entire church that spans the entire world and spans all 20 centuries of Christian history. And so there needs to be a balance there so it's not just completely self-indulgent, but it it's done in a way and has elements in a way that if a Christian walked in from the first century or the 10th century or from 100 years ago, or if a Christian walked in from the other part of the world, that they too could recognize something in it and they could say amen to it. So it's a balancing act. It's totally their worship, and it's totally not their worship. Um, um, there are just certain fundamental paradoxes in the Christian faith that spill over to Christian worship. God is one in three. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human. That sort of fundamental paradox is built into the Christian faith, and so it's not surprising to also find fundamental paradoxes in the nature of the church, and in the nature of their worship. Um, how do you define contemporary worship and what makes contemporary worship contemporary? Um, I mean, let me just define that stylistically. Um, uh, updated English, um, relevancy, uh, music pulled from popular forms of uh, music making, physical expressiveness, which involves uh, a degree of emotionality to it, and informality. Um, those tend to be the stylistic characteristics um, that define contemporary worship. Um, I think at a deeper level, like I said earlier, every way of Christian worship needs to be contemporary if we approach it from the angle of facilitating or maximizing the participation of the people, their full conscious and active participation. Um, panelists, anything else you want to add to that about defining contemporary worship? Only that 
uh, people should buy your book, Loving on Jesus, where you define that pretty well. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and at the risk of sounding like a commercial, which I apologize for, um, uh, the book that we've based our um, presentations on today uh, is also available in um, Kindle book form, electronic book form, and also an audio version. I know some of the participants today are scattered um, across Southeast Asia in particular, and so actually getting the physical copy might be a little bit more difficult. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. Dr. Ruth, um, I wonder if, if, sure. the, if maybe just looking at the time here, we can att attend to a question that's both in the chat and in our, our pre present okay. questions on, um, on flow in, in digital or Zoom or, you know, uh, sure. online worship, um, just to, to open that can of worms for us for a few minutes um, at the end here. The, yeah, that's a great, uh, I'm both very thankful and very hesitant um, that you opened that up. Um, because I think the whole thing about digital online worship right now is a, um, it's a difficult topic. And I admit I have a little bit of a bias and that I don't think Christian worship transitions well to the screen in its fullness. Uh, I feel the same way by, about certain sports, for instance. Um, I, I don't think baseball transitions well to the screen, but baseball in person is a great game. Um, uh, uh, ballet does not transition as dance form well to the screen, I don't think, but ballet in person, when you can actually see the physicality of the dancers in front of you, transitions well. And so... Uh, and part of that, I think, is the importance of the Christian community. But having said that, because of the pandemic, we are having to make that transition. Um, and I think there's something to pull from in terms of the basic notion of flow in terms of avoiding dead spots. Um, if you've ever listened to a radio program where the um, speakers have lost their train of thought or they don't know what to do or the technology actually breaks down or you've been watching a TV program and a live TV program, the same thing happens. Um, five seconds can seem like eternity. And so if you're having to do worship online, attending to the flow in terms of the base meaning of eliminating dead spots and having continuous action, I think would be absolutely critical, regardless of what style you're actually doing it in. Adam, do you have any further comments or any other, other panelists on this? Go ahead, Glenn, I see you're unmuted too. Uh, speaking of five second dead spots. <laughs> well, uh, as a pastor who's tried to navigate this very question. I, I, I feel like um, there's kind of two different ways you can fall. You can, you can try to go the live model where, where, where you might have a rehearsal, but you really don't get to edit things. You just start and end and people tune in live. Say, for example, using Zoom like we're using now. And then you're more prone to having the dead spots and the hiccups and somebody who might forget to share their screen or somebody who lost who's supposed to do the prayer, who lost internet connection. Um, that's messier, but it feels to me more participative and, and allows people to engage in a way. You can, also, you can go to the other side and just do a completely scripted thing where the video is clean and edited and people basically just watch it one way on Vimeo or YouTube um, whenever they want to. Um, it feels to me less participative, but definitely more professional. It just feels to me like those are the kind of trade-offs that we have to make today um, when we're trying to, to, to transition online. And I, I don't love those having to make those choices, and I agree that it's hard to translate. Yeah. I, I would add... Uh, yeah, I'm go sorry. ahead, Zach. I would add, um, especially, I think, Glenn, what you said is, is 
a great observation. Something to consider that I've seen a lot of churches doing, something we try to do. Uh, because we're a church plant and we were meeting in a, uh, a school facility, COVID uh, has caused us, we, we, we're not able to meet there anymore and we do not have our own building. So we have to do the kind of recording beforehand. Uh, that works best for us. But the way that we uh, try to engage with uh, those that are watching is um, uh, the comment section being the way that you engage with people, you know, uh, having people to say amen at the end of prayers or, you know, uh, uh, you know, I come uh, from a tradition where uh, we enjoy the uh, congregation um, participating with us during the sermon time with amen and hallelujah. And so encouraging people to do that. So there are ways I think that you can get at it uh, to kind of help us get through this season. Um, that's so unusual and different. I, would I wanted also, to add just, oh, there you go. go. Okay. Uh, I just want to point out too, that Liz Hinton raised a, a really interesting point of the fact that many services now are both in person and online so that people, half your church is at home watching and half your people are in house watching it. And how do you navigate that difference? What I found we had to do at my church is we, we had to go with ProPresenter 7 was the, the program we were using because with that, your live stream and your in-house can be identical. If you don't do that, what happens is you got a video playing in-house that everybody sees and there's a good flow, but the people watching online can't actually see the video very well, and so it's, it's, it's clunky. The only way you can establish flow both places at the same time is to go, or the only way I know anyways, is to go ProPresenter 7. 6 doesn't do that as well. 7. Um, and then it can match it. Same program, same person clicking, but what the live stream and what the in-house will see will be the same. So I just want to throw that out there, answer Liz. Uh, I just want to throw somebody, somebody else's uh, wisdom into the mix. This is not my own wisdom, but I think this is uh, something that um, John Whitfleet shared, was that in this season, uh, we often come in with many... On a normal, regular basis, we have a sense of what the norms or the givens of Christian worship are. Uh, and during this season, if we're going to engage our church as well, we might have to challenge or rethink some of those givens. Maybe the given is that the, the church all meets together on a Sunday in our building uh, and, you know, and worship has a particular look. Uh, what, to, to, to be effective in this season and to be safe, you might have to start to deconstruct those things rather than being inside our building. What if we gather outside? What if instead of one large gathering, we had smaller regional gatherings? What if instead of, um, you know, a large service that does lots of things, we have smaller services that um, break up the activities of Christian worship into pieces that enable you to do things Maybe the sermon is more effective in an online format, but there are other things that you can't do online. And, and so this season encourages, should encourage us to um, think about those things that we're holding onto as the kind of core givens that we approach Christian worship with. Um, and we might need to rethink those. We might need to challenge those if our congregations are going to have the, uh, a bit going to be encouraged to participate to uh, buy into the worship of the church. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I, I would just like to add one thought to this. Um, other than God, the most important thing in worship is the Christian people themselves and the love and the charity that they show each other. The longest passage in the New Testament about worship is 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, and 14, where most of it deals with particular difficulties in worship, 11 and 12 and 14. And Paul's laying out certain kinds of ideas and do this, but not this, and this is a mistake. But the hallmark of that extended passage is actually 1 Corinthians 13. And the core there is the very end of that. Now, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Um, so notwithstanding all the adaptations that we're having to make in worship, you are not off track 
if your Christian worshiping community is still centered on love for each other, love for the world, and love for God. Um, those are the main banks of the river, and there's a lot of room to do some variety of strokes and swimming in between those banks. Thank you for watching. This webinar is brought to you by the Methodist School of Music. If you found this webinar to be helpful, feel free to share it with your ministry members who may benefit from it. If you haven't done so, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell notification button so more content like this gets delivered right to you. The link to our Facebook page is in the description box below. Like and follow that page to be kept up to date on the latest events so that you can be a part of all this training. God bless you and your ministry, and we'll see you soon.